Please join me in a word of prayer. Lord God, your, your grace is overwhelming and your love is never ending. And as we come here today, we come gathered under your grace, your mercy, your umbrella of love. And we're thankful, Lord, that you touched our hearts and lives, that you give us your word, you give us your spirit. Lord, baby, as we meditate today again upon your word and upon your working in our lives, we ask, Lord, that you would continue to give us the strength we need, the power we need to live out our days to your glory. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. In January of 2000, leaders in Charlotte, North Carolina, invited their favorite son, Billy Graham, to a luncheon in his honor. How many of you know who Billy Graham is? You're a little younger, Billy Graham's an evangelist, he used to have a lot of revivals and TV ministries. Anyway, Billy initially hesitated to accept the invitation because he was struggling with Parkinson's disease. But the leader said, we don't expect a major address, just come and let us honor you. So he agreed. After a lot of wonderful things had been said about him, Dr. Graham stepped up to the podium, he looked at the crowd and said, I am reminded today of Albert Einstein, the great physicist, who this month has been honored by Time Magazine as the man of the century. Einstein once was traveling from Princeton on a train when the conductor came down the aisle punching the tickets of every passenger. When he came to Einstein, Einstein reached in his vest pocket. He couldn't find his ticket, so he reached in his trouser pockets. It wasn't there. So he looked in his briefcase but couldn't find it. He looked in the seat beside him. He still couldn't find it. The conductor said, Dr. Einstein, I know who you are. We all know who you are. I'm sure you bought a ticket. Don't worry about it. Einstein nodded appreciatively. The conductor continued down the aisle punching tickets. As he was ready to move to the next car, he turned around and saw the great physicist down on his hands and his knees under the seat for his ticket. The conductor again rushed back and said, Dr. Einstein, Dr. Einstein, don't worry. I know who you are. No problem. You don't need a ticket. I'm sure you bought one. Einstein looked at him and said, young man, I too know who I am. What I don't know is where I'm going. <laughs> Having said that, Billy Graham continued, see the suit I'm wearing? It's a brand new suit. My children and my grandchildren are telling me that I've gotten a little, a little, um, his word is slovenly, a little, you know, not so well dressed in my old age. He said, I used to be a bit more fashionable. So I went out and I bought a new suit for this luncheon and one more occasion. You know what that occasion is? This is the suit in which I'll be buried. But when you hear I'm dead, I don't want you to remember the suit I'm wearing. I want you to remember this. I not only know who I am, I also know where I'm going. Today I'm going to explore some of the writings in Timothy. And it can be really easy to look at these writings of Timothy, Paul, to the pastoral epistles, 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus, and see all the guidelines that he gives and and you might even look at yourself and say, see, I can, I can do these things. And you might think, well, I'm good enough to do all these things. But you see, if we only look at those things and we forget where we're going, then I think we've missed something. Because I believe in order to see these things rightly, all these attributes that are listed out, these characteristics of leaders, and I believe for all people really, that, that unless we have it established on the faith that our God has granted us in our hearts and lives, we miss it. We need to know who we are, whose we are, and where we're going. So who are we? First and foremost, we are sinful people. But we are people redeemed by God. The scriptures tell us once we were not a people, but now we're the people of God. Once we were without mercy, but now we have received mercy. We were once sinners without a cause, but now we are rebels with a cause for Christ. That's who we are. Not perfect people, but perfect people loved by the Lord Jesus Christ. And whose are we? 
For we belong to Jesus. This morning, 8 o'clock again, and you know, we had baptism last week, one at 8 o'clock this morning again. I, I'm always reminded that in that simple thing of water and word, that God can bring us and claim us as his own. He can make us his people. He says, I've called you, you are mine, the Lord says. Paul reminds us, you are not your own, you were bought at a price. When I was at uh, seminary, my very first year at seminary, I was walking down the hallway, and there was a, there was a sign on, a, on this guy's door, and, and it was written in Greek, Doulos to Theou. I got a guy here probably knows what that even means. But anyway, Doulos to Theou. And so I didn't know what that meant. I'd just gotten there. Someone got my little Greek book. I was lifted up, and it said, Slave of, slave of God. That's who we are. We belong to God. Now, He has made us His people. But because of that, we know where we're going. We're bound for glory. As he's saying, we're but strangers here. Heaven is our home. Our filthy rags have been exchanged for robes of righteousness. Jesus has prepared a room in his mansion, and he has promised he will come back again to take us there to be with him. We know where we're going. And it's because we know who we are and whose we are and where we're going that we receive these things that are written in a book like 1 Timothy, all these attributes, and we don't, we don't receive them saying, see, if I can keep all these things, I'm going to be so good and I'm going to be right with God. We don't do it that way. Instead, we look at these attributes. And we see because God has claimed us as His own, that He has filled us with the love of His love in our lives. That's no longer things that, oh, I have to do these things for God. It's because, no, God, let me do these things for you because this is who I am now. You've created me. You've recreated me. <laughs> and you made me your own. It gives us a passion. To look at these things and say, Lord, let me have every strength and every bit of the power of the Spirit in my life. Because, Lord, this is what I want to be and who I want to be reflecting you in this life. And it compels us, in that sense, to live out these other standards that we see on this foundation. Because we live and move and we have our being in the Lord Jesus Christ. These standards then become a part of our DNA. I, I've labeled the sermon standards for Christian living and leadership because you know, I, I'd say, strictly speaking, this is written to, to an office of overseer, which we would probably call an office of pastor today, deacons, kind of the elders uh, today, and these kind of things. But you know what? These aren't just standards for, for us. These aren't just standards for leaders in the church. You know, when we, when we stand up here and we install officers uh, as officers of our congregation, we say while it, while, it is, while it is right for every Christian to live out these, these certain things in their lives, it is, is more, most of most important to know that you also live these things and, and set the example. But, you know, see, see how that's all inclusive? It's not just about me or it's not just about, you know, the leaders. It's about all of us living a certain way because that's what God has made us to be. So what about these standards? Well, we have a, we have a whole list of them here today. So it must be above reproach. The husband of one wife. Sober-minded. Self-controlled. Respectable. Hospitable. Able to teach. Not a drunkard. Not violent, but gentle. Not quarrelsome. Not a lover of money. Dignified. Not double tongued. You know what that means? It's saying one thing to somebody's face and talking about them a different way behind their back. Not addicted to too much wine. Not greedy for dishonest gain. Holding to the faith. Managing children in households. It's quite a list. I have to tell you, I look at that and I reflect on me and my past and even my present. And I look at that and I look at myself and I go, what, God, what are you doing with God like me? I look at that list and I, I, my, my imperfections just jump off the page at me. And, and I have a feeling that if you, 
if you go through there and you try to hold yourself to those standards and, and say, how, how well have I kept these? I kept these perfectly in my life. I have a feeling you're going to find the same thing happening inside of you. I, I wish I was always self-controlled. You know? I wish I was always hospitable. I wish every teaching I did, everybody go, well, that's the best teaching. You know, it's all this stuff. And, We look at these things and we recognize, man, we're not we're not perfect at those. But that's yet how God calls us to live, right? He, he sets us apart in that way. And that's where we that's where we also come face to face with, with while there's standards, we also deal within those standards with our imperfections, with our failures, our inability to do everything that God wants us to do. You know, are you perfect in every way? Do you always color inside the lines? Do you get out? Do you get outside the lines every now and then? And we have to admit we do. And it, and it doesn't come around and say, "Oh well, God, I tried. I tried my best." Instead, what it comes around to is, is God looking at us, even with our imperfections, and He and He says to us, "You're my people." I've called you and I've made you mine. And, and we look at these things and we go, Lord, you know, forgive us because we, we know we don't do this. And, and you know what God does every time? He's faithful to justice, Scripture saying, and He always forgives us our sins and He cleanses us from all unrighteousness and He says, You're still mine. That's just an amazing message to me. I don't know. How did your week go? Did you live everything perfectly this past week? Did you do good? Did you do everything just right? <laughs> I won't lie to you, man. I know I haven't. But God does. God does. And He, and he continues to lift us up again. And he begins to put us again, reminding us who we are and whose we are and and where we're going, and he puts the same standards in front of us and says, okay, my friends, here we go again. We're going to go another round. And I, and I think of that, and I think, you know, how do I, how do I live up to that? And then I begin thinking back about people. And you go to the people of the scriptures, and you can say, how did they, how did they do this stuff? You know, was the, was the Apostle Paul always, you know, he'd follow everything, he'd live out everything here. And you go at, Paul, he called himself the chief of sinners, right? The chief of sinners. We get redeemed by God. Pouring out his heart, pouring out his life for the sake of the gospel. You know, Billy Graham, you know, just talking about him, you know. You know Billy Graham. Who's this supposed to be in Lutheran? You know that? Billy Graham lived down his life, but I know Billy Graham would be the first guy to tell you he wasn't perfect. But he lived out his life talking about the love of Jesus. Last week I mentioned my friend Vern Gunnerman passed away. His funeral services this afternoon in St. Louis and burial will be Tuesday in Minnesota, his home where he grew up. And I thought about that guy and I, you know, he was, I mean, if I were to take a guy and, and, and put this list, this is his list. This is who he is right here. A barber approach, gentle, self-reminded, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle. He was such a gentle spirit in the lives of people. But Vernon again would be the first guy to tell you what perfect. You see, that's what that's what God does with us, my friends. He He lifts up the standards that this is who I want you to be, knowing good and well we're not going to, be able to do that on our own. And we're not going to be able to do it perfectly in this life. But He lifts up the standard. Why? Because He set us apart. We are a holy people. We are a people with the love of Christ in our lives, so we go out and we live this way in our lives because it sets us apart from everybody and everything else that's happening in this world. And through that, we get provided the opportunity to talk about this Jesus. And He keeps shaping us and He keeps changing us and making us His own. So this, this week, maybe not just this week, but our lives, right? <laughs> 
as we look at these standards for Christian living and leadership, know that they're the standards God has. And strive with every inch of your being to live these out in your life because that, that's God pleasing and God desires. But do it because God loves you and you love Him. Shall we pray? Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we look at these standards that you put for pastors, leaders, people. And we, we pray, Lord, that you help us to live up to those standards. Lord, that is the desire of our heart. Because you live there. You've made us your own. Lord, as we as we strive in this way, also, Lord, fill us with your grace, your mercy, without which we would be lost and miserable and not worth anything in this life. And let that grace reign in us. Help us live as your people, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand as we continue with our prayers for the church.